Okay, so today we're going to address high, um, low frequency noise in the data again, but in a slightly different way, and that is pre-whitening. So make sure you're ready for this. There will be a lot of matrix math and also the matrix-based regression estimation. So if either of those are foggy, return to the matrix algebra and multiple linear regression um, presentations. So referring back to this one-two punch that I mentioned before, uh, we basically apply these two things to remove the low frequency drift that I illustrated in fMRI time series, or bold time series last time. The first punch is high pass filtering. FSL uses a Gaussian weighted running line smoother, whereas SPM and AFNI uh, use a discrete cosine transform or DCT basis set. So SPM is basically adding regressors to the model and FSL is um, basically changing the data. Technically, you can uh, express FSLs as a pre matrix pre-multiplication on both sides of the GLM. So pre-whitening, it says we'll get to that later, but later is today. So that's what we're going to talk to about today. Now, I want to address something that's called low-pass filtering. Um, historically, this was also referred to as pre-coloring. It's generally not great for task fMRI. Um, but there is an older paper by Friston, and if you were to see this, you might get confused because it actually shows a benefit of pre-coloring over pre-whitening. And this is for older methods of pre-whitening. There were improvements, which I will describe, and then after these improvements, uh, pre-coloring was kind of left behind. So that will come up later. So today we're going to talk about pre-whitening for the most part, and I will briefly show this old, old, old result with pre-coloring and explain it. Okay, so this is where we left out. Recall in the previous videos, we've been um, slowly addressing different modeling strategies to improve our fit. So first we have the boxcar, which is the worst model, then HRF convolution improved things a lot, and then the, adding the drift model, the DCT basis, that really helped. So the last step is pre-whitening. So the analogy I like to use for this combination of high-pass filtering and pre-whitening is uh, an analogy for painting a wall. If you've ever painted, and if you're trying to do a good job, you would use a um, roller to paint the middle of the wall. Uh, hopefully, that, uh, at least in the States, we use a roller. I'm assuming everybody has these. But use a roller, and you can paint large areas very quickly. And that's what the high pass filter does. It just goes in and it just, in one swoop, removes a bunch of the noise. But then when you have to paint near the edges, your floorboards and the ceiling, you have to go in with a paintbrush and do that really carefully. And that's what the pre-whitening does. Kind of picks up what's left behind from the rolling. So why do we need pre-whitening? So Gauss-Markov said if our errors are distributed with a mean of zero and constant variance and not temporally autocorrelated, then our estimates are unbiased and have the smallest variance of all unbiased estimators. Unfortunately, this pink part, not temporally autocorrelated, this assumption is violated for our bold time series because the data are temporally autocorrelated. So uh-oh, our error term actually looks like this. So previously when we looked at this, it was sigma squared times an identity matrix. Um, that was the assumption we made before, but there's actually this covariance matrix V. So this is um, a T number of time points by T matrix that describes the correlation between all the time points. So we're going to be focusing on this thing and what are we going to do about it? Oh, and by the way, even after high pass filtering, there is temporal autocorrelation left behind in the data. So here's what pre-whitening does. We basically have this V that we want to get rid of, and we want to find a matrix K such that if you pre-multiply and post-multiply by its transpose, it gives us the identity. So you could think of this as the matrix version of taking a number and dividing it by itself to get one, if that makes sense. Um, it's just we have to do this pre- and post-multiplication because we're working with matrices. That's totally hand-wavy, but kind of how this works. So that's our goal. Find this matrix K such that KV, K transpose is the identity, and then we pre-multiply our GLM by K. So we're changing Y and replacing it with KY. This will still be a vector. 
and our design matrix X we're replacing by KX and then our error term looks like K epsilon. So importantly, whenever you do something to anything in your GLM, if you apply some type of transformation, or uh, not transformation, but if you apply some type of matrix multiplication or something to your Y, to the left-hand side of the GLM, you must also apply it to the right-hand side, which is what we've done here. And then what happens is the variance of K times Y is equal to the variance of K times epsilon, our new error term, and that would be equal to, based on this property above here, K transpose VK, but this thing, we've chosen K specifically, so this comes out to the identity. So that's the big assumption, that this K exists and that we've estimated it perfectly. Well, guess what? Um, we're not going to be able to estimate K perfectly. And that's why in the early 2000s, Pre-whitening wasn't very popular because estimating this K perfectly is difficult because we're estimating it from noisy data. But if we do, if we are able to do this, our pre-whitened model, our new model, is something that Gauss-Markov holds for. So that's pretty awesome. Then you can use OLS to get your betas. Uh, basically, the K, K trans or K transpose K ends up in here which is equal to V inverse, and then you get the same thing over here, a V inverse, and then your covariance of beta hat looks like this. So previously, uh, just get rid of the V inverses, and that was what we had before for the estimates of beta hat and the estimated covariance of beta hat. Now these inverses are inserted here um, because that's where the, the K ends up. I won't go through the matrix math here. So here's how pre-whitening is done, generally. The first step is to fit the linear regression and ignoring temporal autocorrelation. So just fit your standard OLS model. Then you grab the residuals from that regression and you use that to estimate the temporal autocorrelation. So you estimate your V, that big V matrix, and you use that to get K. So if we know V really well, we can use that to get K. Um, and then we can create the pre-whitened model as I just showed and estimate it in the usual way. So it turns out step two is the really hard part. So we don't know V, we estimate it, but there's a bias problem. Basically, um, the estimate ends up not being great. So there are various ways to fix this. SPM uses a global covariance estimate to help with this. What I mean is it estimates, it pulls over all of the voxels when estimating this global covariance, this covariance estimate. So the same V is used across all of space. You might be thinking it's horrible, V might change over space, but this is a trade-off, right? We have to compromise. We're either gonna end up with a biased estimate or an estimate that's less biased and the same over all the brain, which I guess is a different type of bias. But FSL, on the other hand, uses a local estimate but smooths it, which I'll talk about. Basically, both of these are using the same idea. A voxel-wise estimate isn't going to be really great because the data are so noisy. So you have to use the neighboring voxels or all of the voxels to help stabilize that estimate. So recall um, fMRI noise from the last time I showed you all those power uh, spectra of fMRI data, and they follow this a one over F trend, which looked like this downhill slopey thing. It turns out that autoregressive models, which you may or may not have heard of in the past, fit that type of noise pattern really well. And all it is is each lag, so this is the V matrix, so the diagonal is just the correlation of a time point with itself, so that will always be one. Um, this here, the first row, second column, corresponds to the correlation be a between a time point and the one adjacent to it. And this is between a time point and another time point two away from it, that's what the second off diagonal is here. And in an AR, assuming an AR model, you just take one value, in this case row is 0.2, a lag one correlation, oops, this is a typo, not 0.02, it should be 0.2. A lag one correlation is 0.2, a lag two is 0.2 squared, lag three, 0.2 cubed, so on and so forth. And you can see that this quickly diminishes towards zero as the exponent or lag increases. So this is typically what we assume, some type of AR model, or an ARMA, I'm not going to get into it, what an ARMA is, or an AR plus white noise, it's this plus white noise added to it. So FSL, as I said, it estimates this covariance locally, 
temporal covariance, the first step is to estimate the raw correlations, just as I said before. And, or I'm sorry, no, the first step is, which I'm not talking about, is, is, is to get the residuals from the standard GLM. So the E's here are the residual terms from the standard GLM ignoring temporal autocorrelation. And then you just estimate uh, the autocorrelation of the residuals. So for lag one, you time shift, you just shift your residuals one time point over, which is what I've done here. And then you take the correlation here, the product, take the product and average these residuals. So that's lag one. Lag two, you shift it two over, multiply, add together. So it's just standard correlation, lag up to lag seven. So you can see what happened, or I mean past lag seven, but here's lag seven. But you can see what's happening as I increase the lag. There aren't a lot of data points going into this computation. Whenever you have an estimate that doesn't have a lot of data going into it, it's going to be noisy. So what happens with this raw autocorrelation estimate is it's okay, it's pretty good for the early lags, but then it's going to get noisy. And the whole point is we need to regularize things, so we need to reduce noise. So what we do are two things, or what FSL does, is it smooths the autocorrelation estimates spatially, and then within Voxel, it smooths the correlation estimates using something called the two-key taper, which I'm about to explain. Uh, correlation estimates at high lags aren't estimated well, so they're downweighted or they are just set to zero. So here's what I mean about the two-key taper. The raw estimate, so the, the left hand, let's see, is the, this is, this is backwards, sorry, this is the spectral domain. No, no, sorry. This is the time domain, I guess the lag domain, I should say. This is the spectral domain. So this is the estimate I was just showing you on the previous slide, just the sum of the product of those two shifted vectors. And as I said, once we get to high lags, the estimate gets really wiggly because you don't have a lot of data going into it. So what the two key taper does is it first, it smooths through the data that we know are pretty good. And then after a certain lag, it just says, yeah, we're just gonna assume that the lag is high enough that the time points are not correlated, which is a pretty, um, good assumption for imaging data. And here they're just comparing the autocorrelation estimate in the spectral domain between the two, the raw and the Tukey taper. So you can see it's just smoothing it in the spectral domain. Right, dotted line, Tukey taper. Okay, so that's what FSL does. So you end up with a different estimate of V for each voxel, but the Tukey taper has been applied within voxel and the autocorrelation estimates have been spatially smoothed. That's where the neighbors, neighboring voxels come into play. SPM globally estimates the autocorrelation, as I mentioned, and they use uh, a parameterized model. So it's a structured correlation estimate, scaled AR1 with correlation 0.2, which is what I showed earlier, plus white noise. I'll show you what that looks like. Looks like this. So this is the matrix I showed you before. Even with the typo, this should be a 0.2. So this is an AR1 with a 0.2. Uh, this is the scaled AR1. I'm scaling it by this parameter lambda 1, which needs to be estimated. And then I'm adding white noise, which is lambda 2. So this is kind of great. They've simplified the problem into estimating two parameters. That's one way to stabilize things, is to estimate fewer parameters. And they're pulling it over space. And they're just assuming that the correlation structure follows this. Now. As I said, so the two methods I just showed you, those are like the end after years of trying to figure out how to do this, right? That's when things were kind of perfected or brought to the best place they could be. This is before that, this is 2000. So this, I'm only explaining this because I read this paper when I was in graduate school and I was confused and it wasn't a ton of time. This was 2000, the, the pre-whitening methods probably were around that I just showed you in like 2002, 2003. But anyway, this is comparing bias under an AR1 model and efficiency. Uh, so band pass, that's just high and low pass filtering. Pre-whitening without bias correction, that's the important part. So things were not pooled over space in any way. That's the dot dash line and high pass filtering alone is the dash line. So we have pre-whitening here, high pass filtering, band pass filtering. This is the bias of the estimate with various levels of filtering. And this is the variance of the parameter estimates. So this is looking at how the parameter estimates are influenced by these different stages or these different uh, processing strategies. 
And the idea is we want, um, it's a little confusing because this says efficiency, but it's actually variance. You want variance to be low and you want uh, bias to be low. And you can see pre-whitening is really biased here and bandpass filtering looks really good. Whereas over here, the variance is kind of high for bandpass filtering and high pass filtering is okay and pre-whitening is the best. So at this time, if I'm remembering this paper and interpreting it properly, the conclusion was that uh, bandpass filtering was better. Even though the variance was improved, it had less bias. Um, but once the point is the pre-whitening strategy used here is not what we use in current day software packages and the regularization of our space has improved things quite a bit. So if you read this paper, just uh, you know, take, take into account what methods are being used. So bandpass and low-pass filtering have the best looking bias, but they're less efficient. High-pass filtering doesn't remove all the structured noise. Pre-whitening with bias correction, with high-pass filtering, that's what we currently do. That's kind of the standard um, with FSL and SPM. I'm not as familiar with the pre-whitening strategy used in APNE. I know one is available. I believe it's just fitting an AR or an ARMA model of some sort or an AR1. And I don't know, I don't think I've ever seen a paper on it, so I'm not sure how it compares to the FSL and SPM methods, but there is, a, there is an approach there to do that. So here's the last result. I've made the time series green because uh, in this case, I'm not putting something in the model. I'm actually changing the data and the design. And this is kind of a sad step in a sense, uh, this because our T-statistic went down. But this is when you say to yourself, ah, but I've done the right thing and doing the right thing makes me feel good inside. So even though our estimate went up, uh, the variance went down and this went up, we just ended up with a, a net decrease in the t-statistic. So that's fine. So here's the summary. Um, moving down the line, what happened? And yeah, that's it. So that probably the thing that had the most impact was the convolution and then the uh, HRF estimate. So all of these, these two steps increase our t-statistic. Here we did the right thing. t-statistic went down a little bit, but hey, we've done the right thing. That makes us feel good. So got that? Make sure you understand what pre-whitening does and understand the bias variance trade-off with these different uh, pre-whitening approaches. Just specifically, why, why does SPM use a global covariance estimate? Why does FSL do all the smoothing um, it's just to stabilize the estimate because it's a hard thing to do. We're asking a lot from our noisy fMRI data, and these things help. That's it. This one's a little longer, but hey, what can I do? Um, thanks for hanging in there, and have a great day.